Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining uh, this video. And uh, today I'll try to talk about uh, the things that we did and the projects uh, that we did in 2021. And unfortunately, I wouldn't be able to talk about all of them, but I will uh, briefly mention some of them and I will give pointers to the other projects that we did. Uh, hopefully I covered them fairly enough uh, during the past uh, videos, the lectures that I did, the conference videos, the keynote speech and so on. Uh, so for today, I will uh, talk about a very important topic that we are currently living in. So let me share some slides with you first. And uh, uh, I prefer to, to call this topic as architecting for the pandemic. So we are building more efficient computer architectures uh, or hardware architectures to address the pandemic, the current pandemic and the future ones as well. So we would like really to rethink genome analysis so that we can perform such important um, application at a population scale where there's a currently a huge need for that, especially at the pandemic time, we would like to analyze more genomes test everyone for the COVID and so on. As all of you know that the COVID is still affecting everyone directly or indirectly, even if you are vaccinated, you're still at the risk. You are still limited, restricted. You have a lot of uh, restrictions on your travel, for example, or on your movement within the country, within the city and so on, because we are still applying mitigation measures. So it's really important to look at the pandemic and try to help as much as possible as a scientist with whatever research that you can do to address that. So to effectively try to trying to curb the uh, disease spread, I envision it as we have three, uh, three main directions. First, we need the drugs. And unfortunately, we don't have widely available drugs. There are recently drugs that might get FDA approved or they already got it, but they are not available, uh, widely available to everyone. The vaccination, we do have like around 50% of the population in the world are uh, getting vaccinated, at least with uh, two, uh, two vaccination shots. Um, however, uh, some of them um, might get uh, temporary uh, immune uh, to the, the, the COVID disease and they need the third shot or might not get it, uh, which is uh, because they, it's really, it's not widely available still to everyone in the world. So the only effective way until now is to apply stronger mitigation measures. And these are basically what we currently see even after two years of the pandemic and we still have a very strict and strong mitigation measures to curb the disease spread. And we don't basically um, see that uh, this pandemic is going to over very soon. Even if it is going to be uh, ended very soon, we are going to witness another pandemic in the following years. Because this is the history of pandemic, you can see every few years we have a huge pandemic that affects everyone. So it's not about solving the current pandemic, but actually to be ready even for the next uh, pandemics. And how I envision it, basically, you want to control the spread, to control the pandemic. And I envision it as three main directions. There might be many more directions, but these are the things that we would like to contribute or we already contributed to these directions during 2021 and uh, 2020, basically. So the first direction, we would like to analyze genomes. And we would like to do this as many as we can, because uh, we would like to understand what is going on. Uh, what is the, the full genome sequence of the virus that caused COVID-19, how it evolves, and all these questions that we can address uh, by doing genome analysis. It's also important to do genome analysis for people because um, uh, you can do PCR tests, but PCR tests tell you, for example, it exists or does not exist, but does not tell you about the diversity you have and what, what type of uh, viruses you have and how they are close to existing viruses and um, how they evolve, what are the differences between this virus uh, genome and the other bacteria or viruses genomes and so on. So all these questions require you to analyze as many as you can 
uh, all the time. And uh, you want to, you would like to analyze these genomes on daily basis or routinely basis at hospitals, airport, uh, schools, and so on. The second direction is to do metagenomic profiling. So we'd like to understand uh, how these um, viruses living in the real environment rather than just try to isolate the virus from its environment and then do further studies on the virus itself. Because it's really important to understand how this virus, for example, lives in the human gut uh, and how it relates with the other microbiome in the human gut, for example. All these questions are really important to answer so that we can uh, deeply understand what is going on. The third direction, from the time that we start to analyze genomes or try to um, design a medica medication for, uh, for the, this disease, so the virus keep evolving, keep changing itself. There are a lot of mutations, variations, and so on. So the third direction is uh, how to predict the spread. So we want to be ready. Uh, until you uh, make the vaccination available to everyone or you make the drugs available to everyone or until the next variation happening uh, or the next, uh, the, the, the next rapid changes in the genome of the virus happening, you would like to be ready in terms of the healthcare system, in terms of the mitigation measures you want to have stronger or you want to tighten it more or you want just to relax these mitigation measures. So three of these directions are really important and we would like to, we, we did our best to try to help or to contribute to the three of these directions. So the first one is analyzing genomes and we have a recent paper which is um, a, um, a paper that we spent about two years on, uh, on, on this project, trying to address or to understand how the uh, read mapping or read alignment uh, application uh, evolves uh, through the past 30 years. So we know that the sequencing technology get changed over the time. And the sequencing technology is the, the, the technology or the machine that we use to read our genomes or viruses genomes and so on. So these machines keep changing. There's a lot of uh, things going on inside. There are electronics, there are chemistry, there are physics, and uh, we have different characteristics, different uh, methods uh, going on inside the machines. And all these will affect the output data. So the data we got from these machines, which is part of our genomes, uh, it's really different from one machine to another. And that uh, directly impose a restriction on us as uh, biomedical research or bioinformaticians or developers to develop new algorithms, a new hardware architecture so that we can operate on these data and leverage them for better genome analysis. And uh, this is the things we, uh, we discussed in our paper. We call it Technology Dictates Algorithm, Recent Developments and Read Alignment. We publish it in Genome Biology 2021 uh, this year. So feel free to access it. And what we did in this paper is we analyzed about 107 read alignment tool starting from 1988 until today, which is almost 30 years. So for that, uh, maybe I can um, go to the Twitter thread where we discuss this paper in detail. Uh, so what we did over there is that uh, we, we, uh, we basically start an overview about read alignment. So we start uh, discussing each step of the read alignment uh, um, application, which is a very important application, by the way. It's used in genome analysis because the data coming from the machine are not uh, well connected together. So we don't get the full sequence of our genome, but rather we get pieces of our genomes. And then we, we need a step uh, that we call read mapping or read alignment, which can link these uh, pieces or the reads coming from the machine together so that we can get our genome back. And then from there, we can do further analyses such that we comparing genome to a genome and try to infer where are the differences. So in, in our paper in Technology Dictates Algorithm, we went through each step of the read alignment, as you can see over here, and we discussed all the different alternatives and methods for handling each of these steps. We show the advantages, disadvantages of each of these steps. 
And uh, the more important point is uh, when we discuss the effect of the sequencing technologies on these algorithms. So as we know, the sequence technology is commercial device. Is, you can consider it as a black box. We don't know much about what is going on there. We know the concept, how it operates, but we don't know what is going on inside it, actually. And what we know is just the output data. But the output data is real different from one machine to another. It could be the, the, the sequencing errors. It could be the, the sequence length. And it could be the, uh, the number of these sequences. And uh, throughput, for example, is real different from one machine to another, as well as the cost that you pay to sequence one sample. So all of these affects the, the algorithms. And especially, we discuss the three prominent machines. Uh, one of them is coming from Olomina. Olomina is uh, the prominent uh, sequencing uh, company that provides short treats. They are very short and very accurate as well. Nanopore is another company which is very well known, widely used everywhere, and provides very long, ultra long reads. However, these reads normally erroneous, error rate is really different, somewhere between, uh, let's say, one or 2%, all the way to 15%, depends on the chemistry you use, the, the flow cell you use in the machine, and the machine itself, as well as the base color, which is the next step coming after sequencing, where you can convert the whatever raw data coming from the machine into a data that is a human readable format or what we call fast Q format. And we, would dis we discussed the effect of this sequencing technology on 107 alignment and method. And we made a lot of observations in the paper, but here are a few of them only. So the first one is hashing was the most popular technique for indexing and uh, BWATFM uh, BWT FM um, based tools, which is Boris Wheeler transformation with FM index, uh, they require basically 3.8x less computational resources when compared to hashing uh, method. However, this is not always the trend. You can see here the trend is really different. So the hashing uh, could have very high uh, um, computation time or less. It depends on what method or how regress are you in collecting the seeds when you do when you build the hash table and how regress uh, when you also um, uh, collect uh, the number of these seeds or the frequency of each seed. Uh, so you could have a space seed where you ignore some of the characters in each seed or you could have overlapping seeds which will um, um, give you basically more number of seeds. And uh, same thing with the memory utilization. You can see the trend is there. It's not always uh, the best. Um, it's really different. But in some time, it can perform really exactly the same as we have in Force Wheeler transformation tools. Uh, we also observe that the computation time of read alignment is improving about 9.2x reduction in the execution time over uh, many years. So every year we can see improvement in the read alignment time, but there was no significant improvement in terms of the memory footprint or the memory utilization. And you can see uh, over here, there's really trend. So we can see after 2013, most of the tool start uh, taking very less time compared to whatever tools was proposed in the previous years. Uh, and in terms of memory, you can see the reduction is not that much. It, we still can occupy more or less memories. It depends on the algorithm we are using. But uh, in fact, uh, we realized the need for faster genome analysis around 2013. Why is that? Because at that time, around 2014 or 15, we have the first commercial long read sequencing technology, as well as the cost of the sequencing, even using Olomina, was dropping very fast. Um, so we there was a motivation to do more sequencing. So we have more now genomic data. And for that, we need more capabilities to analyze all this uh, flow of data. Uh, we also um, we also made more observations, such as, for example, we find that the Smith-Waterman is the most popular algorithm until now. Uh, Hamming distance is the second uh, popular algorithm. 
although Hamming distance just can provide you uh, the number of substitutions, but not deletions and insertions in your genome. So it was interesting to see, even there are tools still relying on Hamming distance until now. Uh, we can see until today, until 2020, um, we can see uh, tools are still using all type of uh, sequence alignment or uh, genomic sequence uh, alignment uh, that not necessarily relying on dynamic programming algorithms. You can see even there are heuristics algorithm uh, over, uh, over here. For example, you can see a small portion of the tools are still using uh, heuristic solutions. Heuristics mean they don't provide optimal solution all the time, but they might provide near optimal. And uh, it really depends on the application when you need them, when you cannot use them. Uh, for example, managenomic studies, when you do taxonomy profiling, you don't really care about where are the differences between uh, genome and genome, but rather you'd like to just quantify the similarities or how many of these uh, segments are exact, exactly appearing in the other genome that you are comparing with. And uh, majority of the tools utilize fixed length seeding. So the seeds are already uh, predetermined uh, in terms of a length. So you fix it in the runtime and that's it. Uh, however, there are some tools that still use variable length uh, seeding. Um, and we discuss many more topics uh, in the paper and not only read a mapping for genome analysis, but also we discuss RNA-seq alignment, metagenomic alignment, and many more topics that you are welcome to uh, check in our papers. Uh, so, of course, we would like to thank everyone, especially the authors of the 107 uh, tools that we review in our paper. And uh, all of them were very helpful. They respond on time. They provide great feedback. They verify the information that we uh, provided on their tools. We would like to do, thank uh, many more researchers that provide valuable feedback to our studies. And um, also, there is a great team behind this work. It's not only me, but a lot of other uh, co-authors that uh, helped me a lot during this project. As a Safari Research Group, we'd like to thank Sergey Mangol, who was uh, driving this project for a bit of a long time. I would like to thank all his lab members for helping and contributing to this project. All the source codes of um, this project are available online. You can reproduce all the results. You can see the analysis, check everything related to this paper. The paper is also available on archive, so feel free to check it. And if you are interested about this topic, we have a video over there. So feel free to check it if you are uh, new even to this area. I think this video will give you a good insights, good um, learning cycle about read mapping, genome analysis in general. Okay, so uh, let me go back to the slides. Yeah, so um, that was all about the paper uh, that we published in this year, 2021. And uh, we actually received uh, great feedback from the community about the paper. Uh, you can check on our uh, tweet. And uh, I would like to thank all of them for the feedback. Uh, so we are providing two courses every semester uh, about genomics, about accelerating genome analysis, and many more topics. Uh, so feel free to watch the videos. The course materials are already available online. Uh, you can access all of them. And um, uh, these uh, courses are also provided in the next semester as PNS uh, Mobile Genomics and Accelerating Genomics. Uh, so if you are at ETH, uh, we, would we would be happy to have you in these courses. We also talk in other papers that published uh, last year about accelerating read mapping, which is um, the things we can discuss or the things that we discussed as software, algorithms, as well as hardware design. So we have both solutions, both of them are needed. And um, there are a great contribution from the community into accelerating read mapping in general, including the three important steps of read mapping, starting from indexing and seeding, pre-alignment filtering, and all the way to sequence alignment.
We also discuss in many different other uh, videos and uh, lectures about uh, our efforts in Safari research groups on accelerating genome analysis in general, metagenomic analysis, and so on, uh, starting from different components of the compute systems. So we can uh, tackle this problem at the CPU side, the main memory, near memory, and near SSD. And all this work uh, hopefully can uh, help or contribute to, to have more efficient genome analysis. And as we know, data movement between these different components of the system is a real problem because we are wasting time, we are wasting energy by moving data from different memory levels all the way to the CPU to be processed over there. So feel free to check all these papers if you're interested in this topic. And for the second direction, which is metagenomic profiling, I'm going over it quickly uh, because um, uh, in this year, we did not push for uh, some papers in Safari Research Group, but uh, we have some papers that are already accepted. Hopefully we will post them in archive uh, early next year. And uh, in metagenomic profiling, we are interested to know what organisms are present in a given environment, how abundant are they? So it's really important to know if we have, for example, dang dangerous species exist in a subway station or in a university, in a hospital, in ICU rooms, in space, even in this uh, space station, and so on. All these are very important questions and we need to answer them as quickly as possible using what we call taxonomy profiler. And uh, we have a uh, recent work that was published last year. Uh, I was uh, contributing to this with the UCLA uh, people, great people from UCLA. We call the tool Metal Line. And uh, there's a video over there you can watch uh, from the first author of this work uh, to get more details about it. And the, the great thing about our tool was uh, really accurate, much accurate than existing work, especially with the recall. We have higher recall and higher precision than almost all existing uh, works. We can see MUTOS, which is also uh, proposed by ETH over there, and we are having a higher recall than uh, MUTOS tool. We also uh, contributed to the CAMI challenge, the second CAMI challenge, and uh, hopefully the paper will be out uh, soon. We also have a tool called Miku uh, that I was contributing to it uh, while I did uh, my internship at UCLA. So the third direction, which is very important over here, which is a bit different topic than hardware acceleration and software development, it, it's developing a model that can predict the spread uh, of COVID-19. Uh, so um, in this work, we call it a COVID hunter, and um, we have the paper already out on uh, archive, med archive. We have a video over it. We presented in ISMB as a poster uh, this year. And in this work, uh, we know that essentially all models are wrong because basically they are predicting, and we don't know if this prediction is correct until we witness that time. So we are trying to do really useful one. We know that might not be um, uh, might not be the most accurate one or might not be correct, but we are trying to provide something useful where everyone can flexibly change the parameters in the model or change the model itself to fit the needs of different countries. And. Uh, as simple as this, COVID Hunter works by first predicting the daily reproduction number. If you don't know the reproduction number, is the estimated number or the average number of people get infected by one person. So if you said the reproduction number of a Delta variant was about 2.7 in most of the countries, that means each person will infect somewhere between two or three person every time uh, or at a given time, basically. And if we talk about the Omicron uh, variant, we can see that it's double than the Delta variant effect. So the reproduction number can start from somewhere of five uh, person get infected. So we, uh, we uh, feed all these information such as the variations we have in the viruses. So we can study different variants. The mitigation measures, the currently applied mitigation measures uh, over region. And then also the weather 
uh, the weather or the environment changes. So if it is hot weather, if it is cold weather, if it is windy, if there are um, radiation, if there are pollution, all these parameters can be fit into a COVID hunter. And then based on all of these, we have our own mathematical model to predict the reproduction number. And uh, after that, we try to track each individual in the population. So we require information such as vaccination, the vaccination, the travelers or the cross borders, especially here in Europe, people can travel freely between countries. So uh, you need to consider these for accurate production because they might have the, the, the COVID new variants or they might have the disease uh, to be uh, injected into the population to start a new pandemic or a new wave. Uh, plus some statistics about the, pop the population. And based on that, we can track each ind individual and cluster them or label them based on different stages of the COVID uh, disease. And then we predict the daily number of cases based on that. And then we have mathematical modeling for the hospitalization and death. And we consider all of these uh, within uh, our model. And you can see the, the actual production, uh, uh, it's already public online. You can access it using this link. You can see many more statistics, but here's just one example of the cases that we provide. Everything uh, is dynamically visualized. So you can uh, isolate some of these plots. You can uh, zoom in, zoom out, and you can focus on the other uh, production models that provided by US government, UK government, uh, Switzerland uh, as well, uh, government, uh, as you can see. And also we provide other four productions runs for during the past two years. So every six months we carry out a new productions and see how are the things evolving. Uh, however, the, the production time is really flexible. You can control that using the source code and um, uh, change everything in this model. The, as I mentioned, the source code is available. Uh, and uh, to reproduce the results we are providing in our visualization website are also available online. Uh, feel free to access this GitHub page and try to access whatever you feel you would like to change. And uh, this is the video we were explaining more about the technical details of COVID Hunter. The paper is also available on archive and it's under review uh, with some of the journals. Uh, so feel free to uh, go through the paper and you can send us uh, details or questions or anything you feel might be helpful for you and for us. So these were the three directions that we try to uh, contribute to so that we can control the pandemic for the, the current one and even to get ready for the future pandemics. And there are many pointers and papers uh, that I'm um, happy to include here. So feel free to access them. This is the paper where we talk about hardware acceleration of existing tools. And this is uh, a, a brief comp uh, talk where we talk about uh, our existing works and accelerating genome analysis. This is a more introductory video about three hours lecture on genome analysis, uh, starting from uh, basic knowledge all the way to more advanced knowledge on this topic. Uh, there are more lectures such as this, and here from Professor Nurmutlu, other papers um, that we even accelerate using near data uh, uh, at PGA acceleration. Uh, this is very recent work we did this year as well. And there are more uh, papers, uh, lectures from other members of our group. So feel free to check them. And that was all for uh, trying to architect for the pandemic. So I wish everyone a happy new year. Uh, please enjoy the holidays, stay safe, stay healthy, and have fun with the families. Thank you so much.